So Exodus chapter 20 again. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 14, commandment number 7, and it is, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Very straightforward uh, command, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And so this is a very important thing, and I want to share some things with you tonight when it comes to this commandment that I think will be very important. These are I want to share some things with you tonight that... You know, husbands, I think we need to remember, wives need to understand these things, and we need to teach some of these things to our children. Sometimes when it comes to certain things, uh, we're almost too quiet with our children, and what ends up happening, they, they start having problems later on as they get older, and we need to prepare them. There are some things we need to prepare them for. There are some sins, there are some things that they're going to struggle with, and uh, we what we do we want to prepare them. we want to prepare our children to succeed and we want our marriages to succeed and this uh, sin of adultery okay this is a horrible sin it is one that has a, a terrible effects I mean it ruins marriages it ruins families it is a horrible horrible thing in the Bible very simply thou shalt not commit adultery and turn over to Matthew chapter nineteen Matthew chapter nineteen. In verse 3, it says, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said to them, Have ye not read that which he made them at the beginning, made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, shall, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. So right there we see that committing adultery... It's not just if you, you know, cheat on your husband or your wife, but even if you get divorced and you marry someone else, the Bible says that's adultery. And we see here, they, you know, the Pharisees, you know, why did Moses do this? And this is kind of another lesson. A lot of times when we look at laws that are in the Old Testament, you know, people will look at that law and they will say, well, you know, obviously this is okay because it's in the law. For example, there's a law about, you know, beating your slave, all right? If you beat your slave, you know, you're not supposed to kill them, all right? You know, you're not supposed to, and so it's like, okay, so is the Bible okay with you beating your slave? You know, is the Bible okay with us having slaves? Well, listen, some of the laws that were in there, it wasn't necessarily God saying, I approve of this, like I approve of your beating your slave, but here we have people that are beating their slaves, they're beating them to death, and so God put a law limiting things on there. It doesn't mean he's okay with that. It just means, you know, hey, listen, you know, if you're going to have slaves, you know, here's some guidelines for you. And when it came to the divorcement, okay, these people, they were hard hearted. They weren't going to listen. And so God did. God allowed them to have a bill of divorcement, but it was not what he wanted. It never pleased God. It was never a good. It was never considered a good thing. And we see the most important covenant that there is on earth is the marriage covenant. Okay, with the exception of our covenant that we have between us and God, when we got saved, the marriage covenant is the most important earthly covenant. You know, you promise to keep yourself only unto her or him for as long as you both shall live. And that is, that is a covenant and that sin of adultery in the Bible is one that came with the death penalty. It was another very serious one. Leviticus 20 verse 10 says, And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. And you know, today this penalty might seem harsh, but think about this. If we still had that law, there wouldn't be near as much adultery, would there? A lot of people would be like, you know what? Yeah, this husband, he's not that great, but you know what? If I go and I commit adultery, I'm dead. So, you know what? I might as well put up with this guy. You know, a lot of husbands, the same thing. I, you know, I don't like my wife very much, but you know what? If I go and I commit adultery, I'm going to die. You know what? 
maybe we should figure out how to make this marriage work. And maybe a lot of people would work through their issues instead of running away from these things. But that, that's what people do today. You know, there would be very little divorce because you could still get divorced and not be committing adultery. But even if you're divorced, if you marry someone else, you would be committing adultery. You know, a person who gets divorced, I don't believe they've committed adultery until they end up with someone else. Look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 27. It says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right eye offend thee, cut it out, off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Okay, so right here, and real I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but when it says save for the cause of fornication, all right, many people will use the fact, well, my spouse committed adultery, therefore I have biblical grounds for divorce. And I hate when people say biblical grounds for divorce. Please don't say biblical grounds for divorce around me. I'm going to get really mad, okay, because and I, I like to be nice to people, but I get real frustrated when I hear that because it's like, all right, show me your biblical grounds for divorce. And they, they can't. Because the only one that there is is saving for the cause of fornication. We'll go read about that in the Old Testament. If you were espoused to someone, okay, today we use the term engaged, and it's not quite the same, but when you were espoused to someone, that was when you're basically engaged, they were considered your husband or your wife, even though you had not come together physically. And if during that espousal time you found out that your that uh, your wife was not a virgin, you were allowed to divorce her, biblically. And so if you find out that someone that you're engaged to is been unfaithful, you can break off that engagement and there's nothing wrong with that. But that, that's what for, save for fornication means. Okay, After you're married, if you go and you fool around with someone else, that's adultery, it's not fornication. There's a difference, okay? So if you say you have biblical grounds for divorce, but you've been married and you've come together, you don't have biblical grounds for divorce anymore, okay? So don't throw that one at me. That's just, that's not right. That's taking the Bible out of context. But there, but there would there be very little. But notice what he said in that passage. He said, if you put away your wife, it says you cause her to commit adultery, Okay? Now, how does divorcing somebody, if divorce is not adultery, how is divorcing someone causing them to commit adultery? Well, you notice before in that passage, it said, you know, whoso looketh on a woman to lust after hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Okay. Now, once again, when it comes to the death penalty, we, the Bible never teaches we should put somebody to death because they committed adultery in their heart. Because man can't see the heart, can they? But what's but what's that? Once again, that's showing how, in the eyes of God, we're even guilty of this commandment. Okay, if you ever looked at a woman to lust after, you're guilty of that commandment in the eyes of God. That doesn't mean you deserve to die, and it doesn't mean that your wife has a right to divorce you because you did that. That is not what the Bible's teaching. But you know what? Let's just be honest tonight. Okay, uh, we need to be honest tonight. Okay, men. Lust after women. Men are attracted to women. Okay, That is completely normal. Now, does that make it right to do it? Does it make it right to lust after someone that is not your wife? Obviously not. It's a sin, isn't it? But I don't care what you say. If you are a man, there's things you're going to be attracted to that aren't necessarily right. Okay, and listen, we're not a bunch of hippies here, all right? We, if we feel like doing something, it does, we know it doesn't mean it's okay to do that. Okay, we are, we're not animals, people. I had a lady yesterday that told me that we we're just animals. Okay, we're all, we're all basically just animals. No, we're not. 
And we are, we are not animals. We are people. And we ought to have some moral restraint. But listen, there are going to be plenty of things that are going to come along in your life that are sinful that you are going to want to do. That you are going to feel like doing. And we need to teach our kids this. We need to help them understand this. Because one of the things that happens, especially in these repent of your sins churches, and you've got these preachers that are out there that are teaching this, that, you know, little kids, you know, it's hard for them to get saved. You know, you, pro- you, know, you probably want to wait until they're older. Or, you know, if you have a little kid that wants to get saved, you know, don't lead him in a sinner's prayer or anything unless he's really pushing it. There's people out there preaching this. Okay? Because of the fact that you know they don't they don't know how to repent of their sins yet because they don't really have much to repent of. But the Bible doesn't teach that we repent of our sins to get saved. It teaches we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says we need to come as a little child. But here's what happens: we have all these preachers teaching you have to repent of your sins. And bless God, when I got saved, I quit doing all those old sins. I stopped doing all those old things. I don't. I never wanted to do them again. And then you have these young people that grow up. In Christian homes, they've been taught the Christian way of life their whole life, and they start getting older, and they start having these sinful desires. Your boys start getting older, and they start having the desire to look. And if you have the desire to look, and if, and if you look, you're going to have the desire to touch. Okay? The Bible says it's good for a man not to touch a woman, but to avoid fornication. Okay, and we'll, we'll cover that in a little bit. You're going to want to do some of these things. If you're a man, even if you're married, if you look too much, you're going to want to touch. It's not right, but it's just what it is. And I don't care how spiritual you raise your boys. When they start getting older, they're going to start noticing. And you've got to train them and you've got to teach them. You know what? You might like that, but you've got to control yourself. You don't just do whatever you feel like doing, whatever you think about doing. And the, when, the reason it says, if you put away your wife, you cause her to commit adultery is because being without a husband or wife is going to, you are going to want someone else, aren't you? You're going to want somebody else. And most people, when they end up single again, what is it they eventually do? They eventually, they go back on the market. Why? They're supposed to be reconciled to that husband or wife that was divorced. That's what God wants. But the thing is, it doesn't always happen that way. And they end up going after somebody else and they end up committing adultery. You know, Kent Hovind was another one. You know, here recently, you know, Kent Hovind, I, I like the guy. But one thing I, that just really bothered me that I hated when he decided that he was going to get remarried. I believe that his wife caused him to commit adultery. She dumped him. And he's a man. He wants a woman. And you know what made me mad about that whole thing? Instead of just saying, you know what? I'm a man. I can't control myself. I'm going to commit adultery. He got up there and acted like it was all spiritual and God did this. No, just admit that you're a man and you can't control yourself. And you are going to go ahead and commit adultery. Because that's what, listen, if my wife dumped me, you know, I should, I'm not saying I would. And I, I, I'm saying that I shouldn't marry somebody else, but, you know, it, that would be hard. And I hope that I would never get up and get all spiritual and start changing the Bible to say, well, what I'm doing is not committing adultery. No, she would be causing me to commit adultery. I'm not saying I would do it, but it would be tempting. It would be hard because, you know, I am a man. And listen, I don't want to get, you know, I don't want to get, you know, too graphic or anything here tonight. But listen, you know, we do. We have that desire for the opposite sex. It's absolutely normal. And that, and so when you divorce your wife, yeah, you're not committing adultery, but you're going to cause the other one to commit adultery and you're probably going to do it too. And we ought to avoid that at all costs. That's why you just need to stay together. You need to figure it out. You need to work it out. When you divorce your spouse, that other one, they're going to want to marry again. And so you know, and we're going to, I'll cover more of this here in a little bit. I want to show you a few other things before I get into what I'm really wanting you to see tonight. But, you know, should there still be a death penalty for adulterers? Okay, now listen, if you've ever committed adultery in the past, don't go getting all offended tonight and saying, Brother Tommy thinks I should be dead. All right, Brother Tommy wants to kill me. All right, I'm going to show you something tonight that I think will help you understand God's law and understand the Bible and show what we teach is consistent. Because, all right, for example... 
we would let someone who has committed adultery in the past join our church. Okay? We have people who have committed adultery in the past that are a part of our church. And they are, uh, you know, we are thrilled to have them as a part of the church. But yet the Bible had put the death penalty on adultery. Now then we have homosexuality that also has the death penalty. But we wouldn't let a homosexual join the church. Isn't that kind of an inconsistency? Isn't that a double standard? Well, I'm going to show you very clear from the Bible how that is not a double standard at all. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, it, it, I believe it will be very clear by the end of this message. But so what people do, because you know you got people like us that teach, you know, there should be a death penalty for sodomites, and then you got all these, you know, Christians that just get nervous and scared about that stuff, and well, you know, I don't, I don't think they deserve the death penalty, you know, and well, what about you know murderers? Well, no, you know, murderers, yeah, but what, then they'll be like, well, what about adulterers? Because you know how many adulterers, former adulterers, we have in the church. You think those people, you know, I'm not name somebody. You think this person ought to be dead? Well, you know, and then they'll say Jesus did a base. And so what they're doing is they, if you're going to be consistent, a lot of people, they just back down and yeah, no death penalty. And then they'll use John chapter eight. Okay. Turn over to John chapter eight. This is the famous story of the woman taken in adultery. And y'all, y'all know this story. But look what it says in verse 1. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. Accuse him to who? Obviously not the Jews because that wasn't their law to put to stone somebody that had committed adultery. Who were they going to accuse them to? They were going to accuse them to the Romans because the Romans were the ones that were in charge during that time and they were not allowed to put people to death. Remember later in the book of John when they brought Jesus to Pilate and they're wanting Pilate to put Jesus to death, he said, do to him according to your law. And they said, you know, you know they said it was against the law for them to do it. It was against Roman law for the Jews to put anyone to death. The Romans had to do it. And so they did. They delivered him over to the Romans and they were the ones that crucified Jesus. And so if Jesus would have said, stone her, then they could have ran to the Romans and said, look at what Jesus did. He had a woman put to death. That's against the law. And then the Romans would have come down on Jesus. If Jesus says, she doesn't need to be put to death, then they could accuse him according to the law. Because, yes, she was supposed to be put to death. So once again, Jesus is put into an impossible situation. They ask him an impossible question for any of us. But Jesus, once again, you can't outsmart him. He nails it. And you know the story. You know, he stoops down. He's writing in the ground. He does that. He who hath no sin among you, let him cast the first stone. You know what he was doing? He was giving them all permission to stone her. But nobody was going to do that because they all knew they had sin. And so we see that Jesus got out, and then you all know the story. He looks at the woman, you know, where, where are thine accusers? And I lost my spot. Yeah, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, no man, Lord. And he said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Jesus was able to forgive this sin. Why can't he do forgive the, you know, homosexuality? And all that stuff. And listen, there is a difference between someone who has maybe dabbled in a sin, maybe you know experimented on something, done something under the influence of alcohol. Listen, there's a lot of young people out there that they have they have done homosexual stuff because it's cool, because it's popular. But there's a difference between that person and that man that's burning in his lust towards another man, like we see in Romans one. Okay, that person that I mean just as literally, you know, lusting after the same sex, there is a huge difference. Huge. And I'll show you from the Bible what that difference is that I think is very clear. Okay, so I'm not saying everyone who's ever dabbled in that sin 
should be put, you know, put to death and cannot be saved. Okay, I'm not saying that at all, but I am saying, you know, that hardcore, you know, that Elton John, that Rachel Maddow, that Ellen DeGeneres, you know, those people. Yeah, these people that have been living a life of that for a long time, that have, you know, people like Ellen that's married, you know, I think she's married a couple different people. You know, I mean, I'm telling you, these people are gone. But I'm going to show you where that difference is here in a little bit. So, you know, why would we allow someone who's committed adultery in the past to be a part of our church, but not homo? Why, why is that? Well, go, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter... Well, we're not going to read all of it, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, remember there was the man in there who had had his father's wife, okay? That was fornication, what had been done. Now, the Bible doesn't say if they had gotten married or hadn't got married, but either way, even if he went and did a wedding ceremony, God would not have recognized that marriage because you are not supposed to marry someone who had been married to your father. Okay? That was against the law. So even in our country today, if a man marries a man, which is legal, God's not going to recognize that as a marriage. Okay, Because you, know, that you can't do that. And even if you married your stepmom, you could probably do that in America today. But God doesn't recognize that. Okay, that's against the law. That was fornication. And Paul told them, you need to throw that guy out of the church. He needs to be delivered over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. But then, if you go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I believe in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, turn over there, I believe Paul is referring to this man that he had told them to throw out of the church. Look what it says in verse uh, 1. But I determined this with myself that I would not come again come to you in heaviness for if I made you sorry who is he then that maketh me glad but the same which is made sorry by me and I wrote the same unto you lest when I came I should have sorrow for them of whom I ought to rejoice having confidence in you all that my joy uh, is the joy of you all for out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears not that you should be grieved but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you but if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many, so that contrarywise ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. Okay, this, this can only be talking about that guy that he had mentioned in the previous letter that had taken his father's wife. And he's telling them here, this man had obviously repented. This man had obviously got right. And he's telling them to forgive him. Confirm your love towards him. Okay, This was a man who was, in this case, a fornicator and... Paul wanted them to restore him to the church. Okay, He didn't want them going overboard, punishing this guy. It had been sufficient. He had got right. And sometimes people are going to get overcome by their flesh. And they are going to do things that they should not do. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, Lest thou also be tempted. You know what? I worry about Christians who get so down on people when they fall into temptation and act like that would never happen to me. I would never do anything like that. Well, be careful. All right? Our flesh is capable of some pretty wicked things if we don't watch out for ourselves. And so, you know, what is the difference? You know, because sometimes we do. We get overtaken. Sometimes we let our flesh get the better of us. Our flesh is weak. Our spirit indeed is willing, but our flesh is weak. And sometimes we do. We mess up and we fall into temptation. We give in to the flesh. So what is the difference between the sin of homosexuality and adultery? The trendies would say, isn't sin, sin? You know, how do you put one in one category and one in another? Well, turn over to Galatians chapter 5. Here we see something that's very specific Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19. It says, Now the works of the flesh are, the, uh, are manifest, which are these. First one it says, Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, 
heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Notice all those things that he mentioned. He said, these are the works of the flesh. First one he mentions is adultery. Our flesh is going to want to do some things that it should not do. Adultery is one of them. Even murder. Like, oh, I would never kill anybody. Listen, if somebody made you mad enough, you would want to kill somebody. If you thought you could get away with it, you would probably kill somebody. There are some things that come natural to us. Okay, Cain murdered someone when nobody knew about murder during that time. He got angry. Nobody taught him that. No, you never taught your kids how to get angry. You never taught your kids how to lie. You know, nobody has to teach somebody how to steal and do those things. We naturally, there's a lot of things that we just naturally do that are a part of our nature. Okay? And adultery is one of those things. Adultery has been going on since the beginning of time. And it's something that it's wicked. But there are some things, okay? And notice one of the things that is not mentioned in there is homosexuality. You know why? Because that is not a work of the flesh. A work of the flesh, these are things that all come natural to us. Homosexuality does not come natural. The Bible says it is against nature. Go to Romans chapter 1. Go to Romans chapter 1. Well, then why do people do it? All right, why does that happen with people? I'll, I'll show you why. Romans chapter 1 and we'll start reading in verse 24. It says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Do you realize there are some sins that you have to go out of your way to do? There are, now, there, there are some sins that you have to work to not do them, don't you? Being selfish, okay? You have to work on that. Being lazy. You have to work at not being lazy. But do you realize there are some things that, you know, it would take work to do, okay? I mean, there are some things that are just disgusting to us. I mean, there are some things that there's just, that you wouldn't do. You know, there are some things that are just, they're not appealing to us at all. And I don't want to get graphic and I don't want to, I don't want to get too descriptive tonight, but listen, there are plenty like, you know, for example, too, you know, torturing someone. Okay. Now the Bible says murders is one of the works of the flesh. Okay. And I, I, I talked about it last week. If somebody broke into my house, I would have no problem shooting them. Okay. But you know what? I would never tie them up and start torturing them. I, I can't imagine doing that. Okay, that goes against nature. Now, there's people that can do it. And there's a reason why they can do it. And there are some things, you know, physically, you know, there are some things that are, that are sinful when it comes to lust, when it comes to, you know, male and female, that, you know, we, do, we have to work at not doing them. But there are, there are some things that people are doing today that they, it repulses the normal person. But yet some people do it. Why do they do it? The Bible says God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Why did he do that? Why did he give them over to a reprobate mind? Well, it says right here in verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasures in them that do them. 
Okay? They were filled with all unrighteousness. You know what that's saying? They gave their lives over to doing whatever their flesh wanted to do. And because of that, God gave them over to the vile affections. Okay? And the trendies, all right, the wimpy Christians, what they like to do is they like to read the next verse. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. You all do those things too. Yes, we are guilty of doing some of the things of the flesh. But when it comes, but what God was talking about here, those who were given over to a reprobate mind, it was those who were filled with that. Now listen, while all of us, you know, we all, if, if you are struggling with the things of the flesh, it's because you are resisting those things, aren't you? You know, you're trying to stop yourself from doing those things. Even a lot of lost people practice some moral restraint. They don't do just whatever they feel like doing. Okay? They do. There's, they try to, you know, control themselves. They don't just, you know, lose their temper all the time. They don't just kill everybody that they feel like killing. You know, there are men out there. They struggle with lust. They're lost. But you know what? They have enough moral restraint that if they're married, they're going to do their best not to cheat on their wife. You know, they're not just going to do whatever they feel like doing. But there are some people that are filled with all unrighteousness. They have no moral restraint. They are not stopping themselves. And because of that, when, because they're doing nothing to stop themselves, God finally gives them over to that reprobate mind. And you know what? The sins of the flesh that we desire, that might give us a temporary thrill, these people who get all the thrills in those things, end up, it ends up not being thrilling for them anymore. And so they've done everything that the flesh desires, and so God, you could say, as punishment, says, okay, I'm going to give you some new desires, and these are desires that are going to destroy your body. Like, and, and homosexuality does that. And look what it says uh, over in... 1 Corinthians chapter 6. People like using this one. They like using this one too. Know ye not. Oh, I'm losing my microphone here. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? Neither uh, fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Uh, losing my spot. Uh, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. People like to use that because the abuse of themselves with mankind is in there. And such were some of you. You used to do that. And that proves right there that, you know, that homosexual, the Ellen degenerates, they could get saved. You know, if we just pray for them, if we would just be more loving, you know, we would win these people over. And so, and then let's read the next, um, you know, says for some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus and by the spirit of power in first Corinthians six, nine through 11, Paul is naming off people who are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Okay. And homosexuals is in there. And when he said in such were some of you, he was not saying that they had all done all those things. Okay, because for example, he says, and such were some of you. There's probably some people in here who have not done these things, who have never committed fornication, you know, who have never been drunk, all right, you know, or a vile or sorcerer. Those things, there are some, there are probably some in here, you've never done any of those things. Okay, he's saying, such were some of you, but some of you had done some of those things in the past, which those people aren't going to inherit the kingdom of God. But you're washed. It's not saying they had done all of them and it threw the abuse of themselves with mankind in there because they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. But the thing is, those things that are mentioned in there that are the works of the flesh, okay, or the sins of the flesh, those people can be saved. But those sins that are against nature, once again, that's a different story. That's a different group. There's no doubt about it. And that man who burns in his lust towards another man, that is not a natural desire. Okay? And just because something is a nat once again, because something is a natural desire, it doesn't mean it's right. You might have the desire to commit adultery, but should you commit adultery? No, the Bible said thou shalt not commit adultery. Why did he have to tell us that? Because we would have an inclination to do those things. 
So he had to tell us not to do it. And that man who burns in his lust towards another man, he is somebody who has not held himself back from the lust of the flesh. He has given himself over to all these things, so God gives him over to reprobate mind. And there are many lost people who haven't done these, they haven't done these things. But, you know, most people, because most people, they have some sense of morality. You know, most do. Most people practice some sort of restraint. And as a result of this, many people are disciplined and they don't struggle with the same things. But when, listen, when you give yourselves over to the sins of the flesh, you will eventually, God will say, Fine, enough's enough with you. And you'll get given over to reprobate mind. And it's important that we recognize and admit the weaknesses of our flesh so we can discipline ourselves. And so, some things we need to understand about our flesh and teach our children, especially boys. All right? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It says, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Nobody should commit fornication. But he said to avoid it, get a husband or a wife. Why? Because we are going to want to do those things. Okay, Your boys are eventually going to want a girl. And vice versa. And that's normal. That's fine. And so you know what? God made something to keep us from committing fornication. It's called marriage. And so we, you need us, they're going to struggle with these things. Okay? Your boys, they're going to... And unfortunately, there's stuff everywhere. All right? You got the magazine racks... And you know what? They're going to look. And you know what you do, mom? Slap them in the back of the head and say, don't look. You know, you know discipline yourself. Control yourself. Okay? Don't get all worried like, oh, is my boy even saved? He's wanting to look at these things. That doesn't mean he's not saved. It just means he's alive. It just means he's got flesh. All right? And it's sinful. And, you know, we don't okay that. But we do. We, you know, discipline yourself. All right? The stuff comes, if you're watching television, that stuff's going to come across. They're going to want to look. You turn it off. You might have to get rid of some things to keep yourself from, you know, indulging in these desires that we have. And just be, so just because you have a strong desire to do something, it doesn't mean it's sin. And just because you have a strong desire to sin, it doesn't mean you're not saved. Our flesh is always going to desire sin. And so that when they get older, they're going to be interested in girls. And while it's normal, you have to teach them discipline and just because they're physically mature, that doesn't mean they are ready to start a relationship. Okay, I mean, I've, I've talked to some people before, some teenagers that thought, you know, because they are physically ready for a relationship, they should be able to have one. But no, no, not, that's not the case one bit. You know, and they'll start talking about how they got, no, they used to get married when they were like 15 back in the day. Well, they were also a lot more mature back in the day than they are now. But you know, why would God make them ready so young if they shouldn't get married until they're a full grown adult? Well, you know why? Because it's during that time they're supposed to be learning how to control themselves. They're supposed to be learning some moral restraint and not just doing whatever they feel like doing. Because one of these days they're going to get married and they're supposed to stay married to that person. But if that boy has just done whatever he's felt like doing his whole life, he's still going to keep, probably keep doing that after he gets married. And even if you're married, okay? I know, ladies, you like to watch your stupid Lifetime movies and read your romance books and stuff and think, you know, I'm the only one my husband ever wants. But listen, your husband has flesh and there's going to be temptations. And you know, don't, get, you know, don't get mad at him for it. Just understand you know, that, that is what it is. And you know what? Husbands, don't, be, don't use it as an excuse. You better discipline yourselves. You better have enough character to, you know, to say no and watch what you do. Watch what you watch. You better control yourself. It's not an excuse. And, that, and once it, that's why God you know, gave you that relationship. It will help keep those things under control. But just because your boy thinks he's physically ready, listen, he needs that time to grow up and learn how to control himself. And if he does, you know, he'll get, he should get rewarded with a pure bride. And they can enjoy all that stuff on their honeymoon. That's the way it's supposed to happen. And the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.22, it says, Flee also youthful lusts, 
but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Why is it saying flee youthful lust? Why doesn't it say if you're saved, you won't have those lusts? No, because you're still going to have those lusts. And you know what you do? You run from them. You flee those things. You stay away from those things. You've got to teach your boys and your girls to flee those things. Hey, you're going to have these desires. And you know what? Don't do those things. Listen, don't let your 16-year-old go on a date by himself with a girl. Don't let them go off by themselves, do whatever. What do you, you know what that's doing? That's just that, that's bringing youthful lust. They're going to be tempted. They are going to want to do things that they shouldn't do. And so don't put them in a tempting situation like that. The Bible says flee youthful lust. Don't run towards it. Flee it. Why? Why will we flee it? You know, shouldn't we just be strong and be able to, you know, withstand it? No, we can't trust our flesh. Our flesh is bad. And we've got to recognize that. We've got to put safeguards up in our life. And we have to teach them to flee things because these things are tempting. Okay, you have to teach them to flee these things because they're going to want to do things that they should not do. They're going to want to do things that are bad. And you do, you get all these teenagers, you know, they grow up in church, they get saved at young ages, and they go to these youth camps and they get some preacher up there, you know, you should never do this and you shouldn't even be thinking about that. And, you know, what's wrong with you? Are you just not saved? Listen, it's not a matter of not being saved. It's a matter of they have flesh. And you can control yourself because you have a wife. But listen, they're young, they're hormonal, they're stupid. They're not going to know how to do those things. You know, what they need to do is they need to get discipline. They need to have discipline in their life, and they are, but the desires aren't going to go away. They've got to learn how to control them. Because even after they get married, there's going to be sinful desires that come later. And you know what, wives? If your husband could not keep behave himself during his teenage years... What's to say he's going to behave himself in the adult years? You don't know that. But if you've got a guy that he did, he behaved himself, he controlled himself, and he made it into his 20s, and he, you know, during your relationship together, he did the right thing, he kept his hands off you. You know, he practiced restraint, even though he was in love with you, even though he was in lust with you too, and he wanted you, he was able to control himself. You know what? This is a guy you should be able to trust when you're married too. And that, and so we do. I think that time is important. Is it fun for a young man? Absolutely not. I was engaged to my wife for six months, longest six months of my life. And you know, mom, she's like, oh, you know, it was so nice back when we were dating. No, it wasn't. It stunk. All right, that was worth that was worth six months of my life. Now, was I happy during those six months? Absolutely. You know, I was in love, looking for it. But you know what? After we got married, I realized that. Last six months stunk because this is way better. You know, I didn't think I was miserable and unhappy during that time, but I got so happy after I got married that I found I was miserable and, and, you know, that time stunk. And I hate the thought of being back there again. Forget that. You know, that time, that's for the birds. Forget about that. I I, I don't want that ever again. And, you know, and you young men, you're going to have to go through that time. And boy, that stinks. I feel sorry for you. But you know what? Do the right thing. It's worth it. All right. The rewards are worth it. You will be glad that you did, but you do. You give yourself over to lust. Now your adult years are going to stink. You're never going to be satisfied. And you know, it, it's, it's going to be, it'll be a miserable existence. And so, you know, husbands and wives, we'll we'll turn to look at verse three of chapter seven says, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the wife hath not power of her own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one, one the other, except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Well, wait a minute. Why would my, if, if you know, ladies, you know, if my hus- if we abstain for a little while because we're giving ourselves over to prayer and fasting, you know, why would it be a temptation for my husband. Isn't he in love with me and me only? And I'm just the most important thing in his life. And he would never think about even think about doing anything like that. Listen, your husband can be as in love with you as possible, but he still has flesh and he'll still be tempted. And when you do, when you're not coming together, that temptation will become greater. It will grow. And so you don't, 
wife, you don't have power over your own body. Husband, you don't have power over your wife's body. You are supposed to use each other. There is nothing wrong with that. That is wonderful. That's what God intended for married people. And, you know, go ahead and enjoy. And listen, you know, husbands, render unto the wife due benevolence. Remember that your wife is the weaker vessel, all right? Give honor unto her as one as the weaker vessel. You know, after she's had a long day of, you know, cleaning the house and taking care of you and taking care of the kids, and you had a long day of playing golf and watching TV, she might not feel the same way at night that you do, all right? And so, you know, you got to give that honor. You got to respect those things. Oh, I'm the husband, you know. You don't have power. Listen, you know, you do. You got you to respect each other there, okay? This is an excuse for abuse or anything like that. But listen, you know, wives, at the same time, you got to understand that your husband is a man and he needs you and you help keep him from falling into temptation. Because no matter how godly he is right now, you can backslide. And temptations come. And we're supposed to avoid those things. And so you do. You got, you got to watch out for those things. Wives should submit to their husbands. But husbands need to honor their wives as the weaker vessel. That's in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 5-7. through 7. And wives need to realize husbands are going to struggle with lust probably more than they are. That's because they are flesh. But even though we are flesh, we are supposed to have enough character and discipline to say no to the things of the flesh. Okay, I'm not giving anybody excuse, all right? Your wife, she might be pulling the whole thing where you know, she's being a nag and she's mad at you and she withholds herself for a long time. That's wicked. But you know what? Committing adultery is wicked too. You're not going to make things better by committing a horrible sin because she's committing a horrible sin. So don't you, you don't have any excuses. But once again, wives, even though your husband doesn't have an excuse, if you're sinning too, you are going to put him in a tempting situation. And so, once again, it's like the whole causing them to commit adultery. If you're not doing your role as a husband and a wife, you are more likely to cause them to commit adultery. It's still a sin. It's not excusable, but it's very possible that it will happen. And so we got to watch out for these things. And so, you know, it, uh, look at verse 6. It says, But I speak this by permission and not of commandment, for I would that all men were even as I myself. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this man, another after that. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. But to the rest speak I not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath a husband and believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband, or thou? Uh, how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? So we see here, you know, God doesn't want divorce, but however, if you're married to somebody and they're an unbeliever and they decide to leave, we are not bound by the law to stop them. Okay? Sometimes you might just have to let them go. Now, does that give you license to commit adultery and remarry? No. If they leave you, you have not committed adultery, which is what we're talking about tonight. But is it going to be difficult now to not commit adultery? Absolutely. And what people need to do when that, if that happens to them, you know, just stop making excuses. Stop acting like, you know, it's still adultery. The Bible says thou shalt not commit adultery. And that's why it's such a horrible thing to divorce your spouse. It's a horrible thing to, you know, to leave your husband or leave your wife, you are putting them in a horrible, tempting situation where they are going to want to commit adultery and they might commit adultery. And it's a sin. It will always be a sin. And we should not be causing other people to sin and making it difficult for them. And so, you know, we need to understand, but the, the, these things here, you know, talks about those who weren't married. You know, he's saying, you know, it's, it, it's better, I think, if you remain unmarried, but you know what? If you can't contain, it is better to marry than to burn. 
Most people aren't going to be able to handle that. Most people aren't going to be able to handle that desire of the flesh to commit fornication and say, you know what? Just get married. Just go ahead and get married. It's better to do that than to commit fornication. And so, you know, many young people who grow up in strict Christian homes, they struggle with assurance of salvation because when they get older, they start th- having all these sinful desires. And we've got to teach them, you know, that God saved your soul. Your flesh isn't saved yet. Your flesh is going to desire to sin. Your flesh is dirty. It's sinful. And so you know what you have to do? You have to walk in the Spirit. And if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. But listen, if you give yourself over, that person, all right, you know, that little, you know, I don't want to be mean, but you know, these, these parents, that you know, they got their little spoiled brat that they just give that kid everything they want, like I was talking about this morning. They let them eat whatever junk they want. They buy them whatever they want. You know what you're doing? You're teaching that kid, I should get whatever I want. Well, that kid's going to get older, and he's going to start desiring some things that have some devastating consequences. And if he, at a young age, is just getting everything his flesh desires, he's probably going to start getting everything he desires as a teenager and as an adult. And those are the people, all right, those little doughboy gamers that do nothing but sit around and they don't do their homework. They don't do any work around the house, just stuffing their faces, staring at a TV all day. Listen, those are the ones that end up growing up and being reprobates. You know why? Because they get filled with all unrighteousness. All those things that we sometimes desire, but we hold ourselves back from, that little tub of lard doesn't that you're raising. That, you know, that little spoiled brat doesn't, and he does, he gets older, and just whatever I want, I'm going to get. Whatever I desire, I'm going to have. And you know what? He gets to the point where God says, you know what? Forget you. I'm giving you over to a reprobate mind. And they're the ones that turn into the child molesters and all these filthy beasts that are out there that you and I, we can't even imagine doing something like that. We can't even fathom doing something like that. That's against nature. But those people do it because they got filled with all unrighteousness. And so they need to understand these desires that they're dealing with now, they're normal, but they shouldn't give in to them. And that's why discipline is important. That's why you need to spank their behind sometimes. Listen, when your flesh gets what it wants, your flesh is going to get something it doesn't want. And we listen, when your flesh, and, and, and that's just the way it is in life. Okay, if you do, if you do some things that you want to do, there's going to be devastating consequences. It's better to get a paddling on the behind than getting STDs and all the things people are getting later. Way better to get the paddling. You know, and so if you're but you know, if you're raising a lazy, drunkard, glutton, remember what we talked about last week? That son who is lazy, that's a glutton, a drunkard. The, you know, like the Bible said, stone him. Put him to death. Why would it? Because that's a person who is giving their life over to all uncleanness, all the desires of the flesh. That's the one that's going to turn into the sodomite. And so God, before that happens, before he goes and defiles some little kid, before he goes and hurts somebody else, let's get rid of him. Because he has given himself over to the things of the flesh. And so adultery, it is a very serious sin. It destroys lives. It destroys families. When a com- person commits that sin, he doesn't hurt him, just hurt himself. He hurts many others. He hurts his family. He hurts the other family that's involved. And we've got to be disciplined enough and spiritual enough to never let this happen. And it helps if we admit that we have these problems, that we have these desires. That way we can discipline ourselves. But listen, it says in Proverbs chapter 6, I'm not going to read all of it, but it says... But whoso, in verse 32, but whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. Folks, you, you try to teach their kids these things all the time. When they're wanting to do something they shouldn't do, it's like, hey, it's not worth it. You got to teach them it's not worth it so they can stop themselves. You're going to be temp- you may be tempted someday to commit adultery, but folks, it's not worth it. God said, don't do it. Thou shalt not commit adultery. So with that, let's all stand together.